So today we'll be discussing about uh, chapter eight of the book, which is about uh, data import. I think it's a straightforward uh, chapter. I think uh, uh, Tim will be uh, leading the discussion in this chapter. I think, Tim, I don't know if you are ready for your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Let's just see if it works this time. I did try it earlier and it seemed to be okay, so fingers crossed. Right, can you see my desktop now? Yes. Brilliant. But we are not seeing the notes yet. Are they there now? Yes, yes, yes. It's perfect. Lovely. It's worked. Hurrah. <laughs> That's good. Okay. So um, I think there's not much in the way of slides there for this, but we'll quickly just look at the um, the introduction slide just to get an idea of what we're going to be looking at. Um, so I think in, in the previous um, sort of um, chapters, we've basically been looking at how you can plot graphs and how you can tidy up data. And again, the way the book's presented, it's all a little bit backwards because now we're actually going to learn how we can get data into the computer, into R. And um, basically the, the, the ways we can do that are by reading data from disk with read, um, read very well it depends on the type of file read csv is the most function common one but there's a whole range of different functions which will enable us to um, load up different types of file into r and we will look at um, the differences between them how they're similar in the way they work and how they're different and why you might choose some over others uh, i think also an important thing to look at is as the data is loaded in uh, we can actually pass data into different types of um, field um, using pass functions as well so that um, we can make sure that it's read properly whether it's a numerical string some other sort of character encoding or date time data so we're actually loading it all up properly um, and also sort of hopefully we'll look at some um, problems that might happen when we try and use those read functions and finally having read it and done whatever we want to do with the data, we can actually write it so we can save that data in a format as well. So, so that's basically what chapter eight is all about. Um, so I guess the simplest thing is just to dive straight in. Okay, so if we look at the getting started section, as I said before this, um, you know, read CSV, the comedy limited files, really is the most common type of file that, that we'll use. Um, but there's, there's a whole load of other sorts. So they could be semicolon separated, to, um, which is CSV2. Tab separated would be a TSV. Um, or files with any other delimiter that might mark the, the gaps between different um, fields. You can use read DLIM, which actually lets you specify any character that might be used. Um, to show the different columns. Um, then two that I, I've not really looked at much. I, I don't know sort of whether or not they're going to be of interest to, to others here. And maybe all your family could um, pick up on that if it is something we need to look at more. But there's the um, read FWF and log, so fixed width files and log files. And there's actually a whole host of different file types and packages. So you're not just limited to these. I think one of the great things with R is that there's packages for most things. So you can probably find a package for any odd file type that you might want to load up. Okay. So the, the simplest thing really is um, just reading a CSV. And, and here there's actually just a, can I copy that? There's a text file of a, what is a CSV. Um, now I, I don't know how, how you actually get this in, but I can try copying it into R as um, text, maybe. That's not, that's not copied, has it? There we go. So that's the, um, the CSV. And there's a CS, read CSV is present in both the base R and um, and tidyverse. So I think at the moment I've not actually run the command for the library tidyverse. So this will just be trying to read it all in 
um, as a simple CSV. So I've just taken that text. You can see we've got commas. I've not tried this before, so maybe unwisely, um, I'm going to give it a go now. So let's just see what happens when we try and read all of that in. There you go, it's not foundry CSV. I'll try loading tidyverse. Maybe I maybe I don't need that line break there. And all I think it might I might give up on this because I don't think it's gonna work. Yeah. No, it's, it's the format of it does it doesn't seem to be happy with all of that. Um, but basically, if, if all of that goes in, um, and this doesn't allow me to copy it either, read CSV data, because I don't think that data is actually in here. So this is, this, this is something that sort of puzzled me a bit. I don't want all those lines to get rid of them. So if I try running that, Yes, it can't find the data file. So I'm trying to read a file that doesn't exist. Whereas if I go to one that I know is there, that I'm pretty sure I've run before. You can see we just read CSV. We've got the, the all the files within the quotes and each column and data field separated with commas. So by running that, I've actually got the three columns, A, B, and C and then the rows of data, one, two, three, four, five, six, from running that, um, which is actually this little bit here. Okay, and it always takes the first line of data for the column names. So if we go back here, you can see column names have come from the first three fields in that read CSV statement. Um, and you can change that if you really want to. So here it's saying that you know, if you've got metadata at the top of a file, some information about where the files come from that you don't really want in there, you can actually use skip or comment out data. So that's what this is doing here. So, so here you've got something, you've got a CSV file, but you've got two lines of metadata at top called the first line of metadata, the second line of metadata. Um, and then you've got the actual data you want to read in. But after that, it's actually put skip equals two. So what that's going to do is actually skip the first two lines of metadata and then read the X, Y, Z, one, two, three, um, as the other one did. And you get exactly the same result as we did with the other file, basically. We've got the three columns, X, Y, Z, the data, one, two, three, and it's just completely ignored the first two lines of data. Um, you can also hashtag out comments. So um, there you've used the hash to actually tell R that you don't want the text after that hashtag, and it's worked in much the same way. Okay. And if we go through it, you can see that you can also not have column names. So say that you've just got data without column names, um, as, as they have here. Um, you just say column names false, so it knows that, that those first three lines, the one, two, three, are actually data, they're not column headings. And R has just made up these three column headings, X1, X2, and X3. Um, and it's also showing a uh, a convenient shortcut for adding a new line. So by putting N on the first line there, um, you've actually sort of added it into a second row rather than just extending across the first row. Obviously, if you've got column headings in there, are kind of knows from the number of column headings how many um, columns you want in your, your table. Um, but obviously, if you're not using column headings, you've got to tell R in some other way. And um, that's kind of the simple way of doing it. You can also pass column names in as a vector. So same sort of thing, one, two, three, a new line, four, five, six. And then separately, you've actually 
said in the second half of that statement, I want you to call the columns X, Y, and Z. Um, and there they go, X, Y, Z. Um, something else that you quite often find in data is the NAs or missing values. Um, and here you can say that wherever there's a field um, which doesn't have any data in it, I want you to put NA in. So read CSV A, B, C, N, 1, 2, and there's a dot there, and it's just saying NA equals dot. So you can actually tell R exactly how you want to treat different um, characters that might not be part of your, your data set. And I don't know, I guess certainly for myself, again, I don't know how everybody else uses it, but I I've, you know, sort of tend to use a certain file type, um, which you use a lot and get used to using that type of file type. Um, and you know, that, that's something that's very easy to do. You'll very quickly pick that up. Um, but you, know, you will maybe come across other types of files, um, which you know, sort of can be more awkward if you're not used to doing it. It's more difficult, but um, there are ways of doing it. And um, you know, we will look at a bit in later on in the chapter about how Radar passes each column to turn them into vectors, and it'll help us understand how to handle slightly more awkward data sets. Okay, so um, we're looking again at this this data set that I can't find anywhere, which is a bit of a shame because actually that's that's got the data in there, but not in a way I can read it. Um, but basically it's reading the data in from this file um, and it's actually saying that if you've got an NA, you want NA comma um, and then nothing else afterwards. So it's recognizing it as not available. Um, it's actually telling R what to do with the NA argument. Okay, so now you've actually got the NAs in some of those columns. Once you read the first step. Okay, yeah, so um, we looked last week at, um, at coding style. Um, and of course, when we import data from Excel, um, spreadsheets or wherever they might come from, um, it may well be that they've been um, written in a non-standard way. And of course there are packages um, as there are for just about everything in R to, to cope with that. Um, so you could use dplyr to rename columns, but you'd have to do it one by one. Or there's another package called janitor, which actually will turn all of your column headings into snake case at once. So if we look at this row, can you see we've got it in um, pretty much camel case, I think that's called, it's a whole mixture actually. Um, so you've got different um, styles of column heading, but by actually taking that data and then with cleaning the names using the janitor package, you can see that all of these column headings now are in a similar format. They're all using underscores to separate different words with in the column heading, they're all lowercase throughout, and you know with some of, and it's even recognised where there was things like a, a dot used to break up the two words. It's recognised that's being used for that purpose, and put in the underscore and meal plan. It's picked up on the fact that you've got a capital P there, um, and separated that out into two words. I'm kind of curious if it'd be um, clever enough to recognize meal plan as two words. I'm guessing it can't, and it's just the fact you've got a capital P, um, which gives it away that it's a second word there. Um, okay, so here we've got a slightly different example. So you want to look at the, the variable types. So we've done the column headings. We're now looking at the types of data within um, the columns and the meal type um, is a categorical variable with a known set of possible values. So basically, if we look at meal um, type or meal plan, you can see we've got lunch, breakfast and lunch, lunch. Um, and we can actually convert that into a factor 
which is useful. And um, later on, we'll look at the different things you can do with factors. But it, it actually based you can assign some sort of priority numerically to each of these factors, which enables you to to do other things when you process that data. Um, so we can actually do that using um, the clean names followed by just mutating meal plan to a factor based on the meal plan column. Um, so you can see it was just a character string, which we couldn't do much with um, without having to do some sort of um, expression to recognize what the text means, but we can actually automatically convert it into a factor, which we can do a bunch of other stuff on that we'll learn about later. Um, and the values in meal type have stayed exactly the same. So, you know, it's not changed what we see. Um, the text is completely the same as it was, but the data type has changed to factor, whereas it was character. Okay. Um, and finally, you can see age is a character string um, because, and we've got a problem with it in that one of the data types was typed out as five instead of the numeric five. And that's something um, that we'll pick up on later. Okay, so that's a, a quick whiz through all of that. Is, it, is there um, any questions on that or anything, Aliyah um, Femi, that you think I've missed before we move on to the next section? Okay, thank you very much. I think what I think you asked, the issue is that initially we we're looking at the data. I think the data was not, is not loaded. I think they did not attach the data. I think it's a data, it was not pushed to the repo, the student yeah. data is. Yeah which is unavailable. And also I think in base R, we also have the read.csv that is coming from base R, we, then the tidyverse where, which is the read underscore CSV, which is always advisable we use uh, the read underscore CSV because it is 10 times faster. I think it's going to give us some more clue because it's going to read in the data set as a table, which is a more tidy way in order for, because is going to specify those columns, is going to give us information that this column, these are factor, these are characters, so we can have first hand knowledge of the kind of data set in which we are working on. But when we are using the uh, previous way, which is the read.csv, is going to just read everything in as a data frame, is not giving us more insights from the data. So it's always advisable we work, we stick with the read underscore CSV because of the speed. And they also give us more information. I think, yeah, I'd, I'd missed that actually. I'd, I'd seen that there, it was the same command, but I hadn't quite picked up on the fact it's the dot, which is the yes. version in base R and underscore makes yes. it. I was, I was a bit confused as to how which version of read CSV it might use, but obviously it depends if you're using the dot or the underscore, doesn't it? Yes. And I think that's basically. Um, yeah, we just covered that now, haven't we? You get um, tibbles, which are better. And um, the other thing it seems to say here is that um, base R functions can actually get some of their behavior from um, what your operating systems. They might not be identical on different computers, whereas um, the, the um, tidyverse ones actually don't behave in the same way. Okay. Um, do we want to look at the exercises or just leave them, do you think? Yes, I think it's good we look at the exercise, but also in the chat, I posted a, a exercise solution. These are the solution for all the exercise in the book. I think it's in the chat. I just posted it in the chat. All right. I all the answers. I don't think I can see the chat whilst I'm sharing, can I? Okay. Can I? Oh, yeah, there, chat. Oh, brilliant. So we can find all the answers as well. Yes, yes. So if anybody's got them, but um, we'll have a quick look at, at these now, I guess, um, if I close that down for a second. So first question, what function would you use to read a file where files are separated with? Um, I don't I, I don't actually know what that symbol's called, just the vertical line sort I of thing. That is a tab. That is a tab. That's well, just called a tab, is it? Mm. Um, 
So that would probably be a, what's it, a read TSB, I guess, then if it's tab separated variable. Um, and if, if not, if you wanted to specifically type that in, you'd use the read DLIN function. Um, oh gosh, I'm not even going to attempt this one at the moment. I think if we wanted to find out about read CSV and read TSV, what I'd probably do is something like look at the help package in R. There you go, and there's a whole bunch of stuff there. It's not letting, oh, come on. Let me, it will let me scroll down. So you can see the, the background data there, the information on what they all, all the different forms of it use. You can see they're all fairly similar. Obviously, one thing in read delim is you can actually specify the delimiter. Um, and just by looking through that, the answer's in there, but I'll not try and do that um, now. Sometimes, what are the most, I think the most important arguments for most of these are actually just the, the file path, really, so it knows what it's reading. Um, but again, I sort of don't want to go too much into detail on those because I'll probably get it wrong. So maybe I'm better off for the moment skipping across. Um, Okay, that's a, an interesting question, isn't it? Is it worth having a go at that? So what it's saying is we've got things like commas and dashes. So I, I think that's saying we need to sort of surround some of those with the quotes so that it doesn't confuse them. I don't know if the help tells us anything there. I'll leave that. Okay, so we'll move on to reading data from multiple file types, um, or multiple files rather, all of a single type. So you know you might end up with a whole bunch of files um, that you want to read in in one go. An obvious reason for that might be, of course, if you've got you know a file for each month. And here it's looking at monthly sales data for January, February, and March. And read CSV actually allows us to read in all of those um, files within one statement where we sort of specify them in a list. Whoops, I shouldn't have pressed that. I've lost where I was. Um, yeah, so it's specifying them in a list. Um, so it's actually going to read all three files in one go. So we said sales file is actually a whole list of files. And then we're saying read sales files um, to the ID file. So that is just reading all three files into one um, tibble. Um, with the additional ID parameter, we have added a new column called file. So that's actually, which is what this ID equals file is doing. It's basically saying, add a column um, and tell me what file you got that data from. Because obviously if we're reading lots of files in, um, we wouldn't be able to tell immediately perhaps which file data had come from. Um, but by having the file name there, we know where our data has come from. Um, And it can also be very awkward to write out a whole list. If you had sort of dozens of files, you know, you'd be there having to type them all out and probably making mistakes as you did it. And it would be um, a bit awkward. But what you can actually use is um, the directory function to find the files for you by matching a pattern in the file name. So here, rather than typing in a list um, with, the, with the concatenation, we're saying, look in the directory data, and the pattern I want you to find is anything that's called sales and is a CSV file. Um, and then that is actually going to read all of that into a list for you. And if there's three of them, it might not be a big deal, but if you've got 30 or 40, definitely don't wanna be typing them all out individually. 
Okay. Um, as we said at the start, we'd also look at useful functions for writing back to desk. Obviously, we can write a CSV, so we could upload a bunch of CSVs, um, maybe several of them, combine them into a single file, do some uh, manipulation, maybe tidy up the data, clean up the column headings, all of that sort of stuff. And then once we've done it, we could, if we wanted, output that to another CSV, um, or we could write um, a TSV, a tab separated um, data set, and, and um, both functions increase the chances of the output file being read back in correctly by making sure um, strings are all encoded in the same way um, and dates and date times are actually um, saved in a standard 8601 format so they can be passed easier in whatever other package you might load them up into. Um, and if you want to export a file to Excel, you can use write Excel CSV, um, which um, lets Excel know that it's actually done this UTF-8 encoding on it, so Excel doesn't get confused by the character coding that it's used. Uh, most important arguments are X, the data frame to save. Obviously, we want to get the name of that right and where we're going to save it. Because if we get those wrong, we're probably not going to find our files very easily. Um, and you can also specify how missing values are written with NA um, if you want to append to an existing file. OK, so we can actually handle some of the NA problems a little bit with that. So here's an example. So you can see write CSV students, students CSV. So that's the same file that was uploaded earlier. Um, so you can write it and then you can read it back again. And if we look at compare those two, um, you know, there's certain types of information are lost. So straight away, you can see the factor that we created for the meal plan. That's gone back to a character string. Um, have we lost anything else? Not a great deal that jumps out at me. I think that's the main thing that's been lost is, is that factor information. Um, so what basically if we're working on things and saving data as we go along and reloading it, having interim files, you know, obviously it gets a little bit unreliable if we're losing stuff each time we save it. Um, we need to recreate the column specification every time you load it in. Um, and it's telling us here that we actually have two other alternatives. We can write it um, as an RDS file, which is you know, the type of file format that um, R uses itself. Um, and then if we do that, so if we do a read, write RDS and a read RDS, you can see we've kept the function plan because we're using that data format that R works in. We've not lost information by saving it to a CSV. Um, and yet another package, the Feather package, um, implements a fast binary file format that can be shared across programming languages as well. So um, we can use that format. I guess if we've got need to actually share files between different languages and stuff, then we'd be looking at packages like that. Um, it's faster and it's usable outside of our so, but again, if, if we look at how that's worked, we just done write feather um, and the data it's writing is students and the file name we've used is students feather. And then we're going to read feather students feather. And when we read it back in, it's kept that factor information. So, um, you know, we don't have to use RDS. We can use feather as well as a way of saving data. And I think that that's about it, really. How we do we've been quite quick, which is in many ways nice. <laughs> Hopefully, I've not missed too much, and I'm sure all your family will pick up on anything that I have missed. Um, but you know, we have lo loaded up rectangular flat files from disk into R. Um, I think the simplest one of those was if I can I find that. So something I tried beforehand. If I make sure I've got the tidyverse library loaded. So this is just a bunch of data that I got off the internet. 
just use and um, I'm creating a, a table called Aberporth Base. So this is just weather data from a local weather station at a place called Aberporth. Um, and I'm just putting the file path to where that file is within quotation marks. Um, and if we go now, we've got actually got a data set there called Aberporth Base. And it's just read all that data in nice and nice and simply. So we, we've learned how to do that. Um, and we'll come to data import a few times in this book, so we'll be looking at other ways of importing data later on. Um, and we're starting to get the point, I guess, where we'll be writing more R code. So we, it's time to start learning about how we organize files into directories and the like. And I think that's what the next chapter is all about. Um, and I think that pretty much covers it. Um, any questions, anything that I've missed? Yes, I think I have a question, but it's based on the data set you just read in. Yeah. Just go back to the data set you just read in and. Yeah. The house studio, just share your house studio. Can you not see the house studio? Yeah. Okay, like I want to ask, because I'm seeing some symbols, some star, those star, is it for missing data or what? What, these lines? Yes. Yeah, that, that, that's that's missing data. So it was it was loaded in from a, a file where they used okay. that. And I think they're just character strings that it's it's read in. Okay. So maybe as you read it anyway, supposed to specify that if you find this character string in the data set, read it in as any, that is, you need to put an argument there, comma, n is equals to within oh, string okay. class, such that yeah. R will understand that once we are reading in this data, if you see this string, it's a missing data. Okay, so, wait, so that goes in a comma here, does it? Yes, yes. So I put what, Ed, I can't remember what that was now, I'm gonna to have to go back in the book to find it. Um, Just say n a is equals to. NA equals, and then it's in quote, within quotation string, double quotation. Double quotation. Oops, that's. And it's, then you pass in the three star. Okay. You pass okay. in the three star, yeah. Copy that and paste that in there. Okay. And then if I try and run this. And if I go back there, there you go. Oh, thank you very much. It's putting my NAs for me. I missed that bit. <laughs> okay. So that as you read it in now, I understand that when we find this character string in the data is an NA. But at times you might have different character encoding for NA. You can say 999, some, some software use 999 to represent NA. So in that case, you just need to create a character vector. Then you pass in all those code in so that once you are reading in the data, I will understand once you find such character in the data, so treat it as any. Yep. Great, thank you. Yeah, I think, okay. I don't know if any other member of the group has any other contribution. Hello at uh, Darlene, Christine, Betsy, or Lukunli. I don't know if anybody has any other inputs. I think Tim has done a good job to present uh, this chapter. Thank I you. I think I've put them out to sleep. <laughs> you did a wonderful job, Tim. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Okay. So, in case there is no further, I Miss, I want to really thank you for uh, presenting the chapter. I think I will meet uh, next week. Uh, next week we'll be discussing uh, chapter nine of the book. I think Fanny will be taking us through that chapter, but uh, let me be sure. Fanny, yeah, Fanny sign up for the chapter. So you'll be presenting 
chapter nine next week. So see you all uh, next week. That's great. Thanks very much, everyone. Cheerio. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Tim. Bye-bye. Welcome.